and my friend and I met the woman we now refer to as the Banshee. It was about 10 at night. We were walking back from a milk tea place and we were maybe at mile 5 of a 6 mile total round trip, almost home. We were walking on a long stretch of sidewalk next to a wide road that is busy during the day but almost empty at night. A little background, my hiking buddy and I sometimes go for long walks through the town at night when we can't get to the trails during the day. It's dark, but our route goes through a fairly safe and blend of residential and shopping areas. Usually, we head to some sort of late night restaurant or food truck. We walk, stop for food and drink, and then head back. We wear glowing vests, battery powered, and reflective stuff to make sure traffic sees us because we've had some too close encounters with distracted drivers. We've also had a few encounters with strange people. She didn't start making strange noises at first. It was a long stretch of straight sidewalk and we had seen her coming for a long time before she started that. No one else was out walking along the road at this hour. There were plenty of street lights. She'd appear under the lights and disappear in some shadow of bushes and trees and then reappear under the lights. We were glowing in our vests in addition to the street lights so she'd have to have seen us coming. I figured she just worked at one of the shops or restaurants nearby and was getting done with closing up. I figured she was just trying to get home, just like we were, until she started making these random noises. The first sound was like an odd hacking noise, like she was attempting to clear her throat as noisily as possible, but this was just the warm up. The sound then changed to something like a cross between a crow cawing and a small dog's bark. Rendering text is hard but the closest thing might be a grow. So we kept walking towards her, watching and listening, thinking perhaps she had a disability or some other issue. She looked decently dressed and she walked steadily and deliberately, not like someone on drugs. If not her noises, she seemed completely normal. Then she made these loud but low pitched groaning sounds, something like a mmm sort of noise. It had us briefly making zombie movie references, joking a bit, but we speculated if she was maybe talking to someone on earbuds or making an attempt at singing something, but it got weirder as she added some higher pitched screechy sounds. Something like an angry cockatoo might make, like a cra cra sound. At this point, she's less than two blocks away and she's rotating through these bizarre sounds with sort of pauses of silence between. She looked like someone's cute little grandma. She didn't look like anything you'd expect to see making those sounds. She's wearing an old fashioned thick skirt, a cardigan and chunky looking shoes, carrying a single cloth shopping bag. Her hair is a short curly old lady perm. She looks adorable. She sounds insane. Gra, crow bark sound. Mram, zombie noise. Ka, ka, cockatoo shriek sound. She's getting closer. Her bizarre noises are getting more unsettling, and I realise I can't see what she's clutching in her hand. The one that doesn't have the shopping bag. She looks harmless, but the sounds are too weird. My buddy looks at me and asks, Time to cross? Echoing my own thoughts. We didn't want a confrontation with this lady. I nodded, but just before we step out into the road, the lady seemed to have the same idea. She suddenly veered off to the sidewalk and went into the road, making a steady diagonal line towards the other side. There was no traffic on the road at this point, so I wasn't worried. I relaxed a bit, continuing on. I figured she was avoiding us, just like we were about to avoid her. But just as we started to pass her, she suddenly screamed and rushed at us in the middle of the road. Her mouth was wide open as she charged at us, just shrieking. We stepped quickly apart, and her abrupt rush took her right between us, just shriek wailing that horrible sound. It sounded like it would hurt her throat. Banshee-like is the only way to have for it. We were several feet apart, both braced for her to come back and do something, but instead she veered again and went down the sidewalk the way she had originally been going. As she walked away, she kept looking back at us and keeping up short bursts of shrieking Banshee noise stopping to take breaths. As she got further away from us, she started core barking at us again. We stood there for a while, 
just silently watching until she was a good long ways down the sidewalk with her very strange crow barking fading into the distance. I still have no idea what was wrong with her. Did our light somehow trigger an episode? I hope she's okay. She seemed to know where she was going. But Banshee Lady, let's not meet again. When I was younger, somewhere between 5 or 8, a distant family member who was supposed to be well loved died and one of his last wishes was for the final celebration of his life to take place in his childhood home. His son, DJ, decided to respect these wishes and contacted the current owner of the house to ask if a small gathering could be hosted on the premises and entirely outside. As far as DJ and everyone else could tell, the homeowner was kind and understanding and agreed, offering to help out, being clear on boundaries and such. Fast forward to the event itself, my family's arriving, I'd sat around three in the afternoon and I have this horrible anxious feeling deep in my stomach that I can't shake. I mention it to my mum saying something silly that I probably heard on TV about my gut feeling and my parents shrug it off and tell me it's fine and to come on. I trust my parents, so I step out of the car, all dressed in a cute dress and layered in cheap plastic jewellery, I think Mardi Gras beads, that I proudly chose myself to appear formal for the occasion. My mum, my dad and I all walk out towards the backyard, aiming towards the right hand side of the house, as the inside was off limits due to being private property, when a man busts out the front door holding a bat. This is not just a normal baseball bat intended to occupy the children. No, this man busts out of his front door, screams at everyone, talks about how horrible we are and how our family's disgusting, all while gripping a beat up baseball bat full of nails. Immediately I panic and my fight or flight, in this case flight, kicks in and I make a beeline to our old blue car. I only just got dragged out by my dad. I jump in and slam the door behind me, panicking with tear blurred vision and an incredibly upset stomach. When I look out the window and see the man, the crazy man who made a quick decision to target an elementary age girl as he took a swing at the car and hit the area above the back tyre, creating a loud ringing and dent. My dad, who took what felt like 5 hours but was probably around 10 seconds, pushes the man away and jumps in, my mum following behind quickly. We sped away from the house and back home not mentioning a thing except for how proud of me they were for running and that they'll listen to me if I ever have that horrible gut feeling that something's wrong again. Though both my mum and dad kept shooting quick glances behind the car and whispering to each other. My family never discussed the event with me around again, but when I asked my mum what happened years later, she explained that the man had decided to do a Google search on DJ and found his estranged criminal brother's record on Google and decided that this was evidence enough to attack a family during a wake with a nailed baseball bat. This happened way back in 2013 when I was in junior college. It was our college's organization's annual art camp. For a short description, we're all in fine arts department and our organisation holds this art camp where there are seminars from our professors and mentors and all in all team building activities. It's usually set in recreational venues. As I said earlier, I was in junior and it was our year as, as officers of the said organisation. So we were the ones who chose the venue, planned the games, itineraries and such. To give a brief description of the place, it's in a rural area, around Laguna in the Philippines. It's a huge recreational area, with hanging bridge leading to the campfire, pool area and obstacle horses. In the middle of the venue, there's a huge open space function hall where the seminars were held. Our cabins were hidden by trees located far behind the hall. The first cabin was for mentors and profs, the second was for the girls in my year and co-officers, and the third was for the sophomores and freshmen, the fourth was for the guys in my year and some freshmen, and the last two cabins were occupied by the higher year students. 
On the right side of the function hall, there's an outdoor lounge area with life-size chessball games. If you walk straight further, there's the obstacle course area. Further from it was the pool and foresty area where the campfire and hanging bridge was located. This particular story was experienced by my classmate. It was late at night, around 8pm. Our scheduled seminar was already finished and everyone was done with their dinner. Some of the students were chilling in the patio of their cabin, some were walking around, and us, the officers, were busy with planning tomorrow's activities. The guys, we're going to call them Gab, Wally, Kev, Alan and Hero, were chatting and chilling inside their cabin. One of them decided to explore around. Hero told them to go and play the chessboard area. They decided to go out except for one. Gab approached Frank, a freshman, dozing at the top bunk. He asked if he wanted to come with them, but Frank was sleepy, and he said no to them, turning his back against them. Before leaving, Gab asked Frank if it's alright to borrow his slippers, because he had none, and Frank signalled okay. So the five guys were heading out the cabin, fooling around and laughing. They looked around and saw a student slowly heading to each cabin's to rest. They were almost a few yards from the chessboard, when Gab noticed someone was walking parallel to them. The guy was heading to a large old coconut tree adjacent to the chessboard area. He was confused and stopped walking. Wally, Kevin, Alan and Hero noticed the walking guy as well. It was already dark around with minimal lights far from them. Gab tried to rub his eyes and recognised the walking guy. It was Frank. They all shouted, Frank come here! Hero realised Frank stopped walking and turned to them. No expression at all. Alan was confused as well and asked if it was really Frank. Gab realised something creepy and faced the guys. How could it be Frank when I'm wearing his only slippers? He mumbled nervously. They all looked at the guy they were calling earlier and noticed it continued walking and then suddenly disappeared behind the old coconut tree. The guys collectively gasped, run and shouted loudly back to their cabin. When we reached their door, Wally opened it to find Frank was sleeping deeply with his headphones on. They woke him up and slapped him softly, and asked if he's okay or if he walked outside. Frank rubbed his eyes open, saying no confusedly. The five guys got so scared, they tried to outrun each other heading to the cabin to tell us what happened. I was so scared, but not actually surprised, since I felt creepy around the area during night time. It felt really strange and off. I've had my experience the night before, but not sure if it was paranormal. I awake only at that time, it was 2am, and I hear giggling around the cabin, like kids running around and chasing each other. I also noticed silhouettes walking past our screen door, though I personally try to dismiss it and think of it as some of the students were still awake and falling around outside, but I was unable to sleep until 5am. I believe that place had ghosts and elements in it, as per their account of some of the students as well. You can easily tell if there's something creepy in a place just by the feels it gives off. My high school cross country team used to run practices in the wooded trails along the river a few times a week. We were usually a pack of 10 to 20 girls and it was always around 4pm so no one thought of it as being particularly dangerous. Most of the people you'd encounter in the woods were other runners, kids or dog walkers. One afternoon we were only about a group of six. After running out a mile or two, we came across this big, out of service arc shaped water feature we frequently passed on our runs. It was basically a giant hole cut out of a ravine that opened up into a dark tunnel. The inside of the dark tunnel was pitch black, you couldn't see a thing, even in the late afternoon light. We happened to slow down slightly as we passed the tunnel because someone needed to adjust their shoe or something. Someone called out to us from the top of the arc. It was this shabby, dirty looking man. He wasn't obviously homeless looking, but he might have been. He told us that he was trying to get a fire going in the tunnel and asked if we could go check if it was burning by going into the tunnel and looking around. For obvious reasons this made no sense. We were sheltered, friendly and naive. One girl, Kate, said sure and started walking towards the tunnel opening. I got that sinking feeling that something was wrong, which only got worse as I noticed the guy was shifting around with something in his pocket. I called out to Kate, telling her to come back just before she reached the mouth of the tunnel. I got everyone running again, 
pick up the pace this time. We bickered over whether or not we were being paranoid as we finished our run. When we completed the loop and passed the tunnel again, the guy was gone. I hate to think of what could have awaited us in the tunnel. Obviously there was no fire burning inside, we would have seen it from where we were. Even if the guy hadn't succeeded in starting this fire, there was no reason to be standing away from it, waiting at the top of the tunnel. Okay, this happened probably around 2002. I moved to Belfast from London, and I would have been like 11. I'm 30 now. Anyway, I lived in a new area. A lot of houses, etc. were being built, and they were all massive and beautiful houses, despite being a terrible area I thankfully no longer live in. I'm with a friend called Dave. We're looking for my sister, and we got around the corner from my house, down where they are building a bunch of houses. It's pretty dark, I'd probably say about 10 or 11 p.m. I don't really remember why we were actually looking for my sister. I don't even think she was around. Anyway, we're walking past houses that look pretty much finished. We're chatting, and a guy randomly shows up out of the loo behind us, grabs a hold of me. Dave, by this stage, is batshit petrified and runs away crying and climbs over a fence. Completely ditches me. This guy is very casual despite being creepy and I'm not as freaked out as I should be. I assume he's a provy, which is someone who watches the streets in West Belfast. He's got a hold of me and it's like when you've been caught in a place you shouldn't be in. I expect him just to be like, you shouldn't be here at night whilst we're patrolling the streets etc. But suddenly we go to a house which isn't completely built yet, and no one lives in it. Well I think. I'm literally standing inside this basement looking house whilst he's outside phoning the cops. I assume he's fake calling the cops, the conversation sounds fake, and he just sounds like he's trying to scare me, and he is. I get really freaked out now though, cause upstairs there's like this constant tapping sound and it can't be a builder by himself at like 11pm surely. It sounds like someone's locked in something trying to get out. That scared me. It was the speed of the sound, as if they knew I was in the house. It sounded like they were trapped upstairs or something. Suddenly he's off the phone and he's like, okay the cops are coming to your house soon, leave now. I'm thinking, nah not really. I didn't give you my address. But at the same time, I was freaking out because maybe this guy knows the streets and where I live. So that entire night, I was just like looking out my window hoping no cops would come. They didn't in the end and obviously did all of this just to scare me. But why? This situation for me is scary because a guy randomly grabbing a hold of you in the street in pitch black darkness is freaky regardless of whether or not it's a building site. And I probably shouldn't have been there. He could have put me in a room and locked the door, had someone torture me or something. I've always wondered like, why was he there? What was he doing? Afterwards, I was scared to go out at night in the area unless I had someone with me. Truth be told, there were a lot of issues in the area, and I'm guessing that guy and a bunch of other guys were acting like undercover cops since they weren't usually comfortable coming to where I lived since they'd usually get bricked. It comes from the troubles. Looking back though, I think the entrance was blocked off, and we weren't actually allowed in there. Considering the situation, I was actually pretty calm compared to my friend, and I have terrible anxiety. I think I just assumed that this guy wasn't bad, but again, on any given day, he could have been bad. I appreciate the feedback guys, considering this is my first story on here. For me, because the guy showed up, and being in the house etc, things happened for the sake of 5-7 to seven minutes, it was hard to fully digest what was going on and reminded me a little bit of the film audition. Obviously, nowhere near as freaky, but the sound upstairs was similar to the guy in the scene from the audition. If you've watched the film, you'll know what I mean. Hello Reddit. I'm not sure if this is the right subreddit, but I really didn't want to meet that person. So, here we go. A little context, my dad and I live together in our own multi-family home in Germany. My dad has a serious lung condition, 
His lungs produce and trap excessive amounts of mucus. The trapped amount is huge and keeps lungs from working correctly. It's pretty normal that he has to be picked up by an ambulance every two to three weeks because he can't breathe anymore. Last week, it was that time of the month. He couldn't breathe. I called an ambulance. He was brought to the closest hospital. Pretty normal for me because this happened at least 10 times in the last six months. So I went to bed after he got picked up on a Tuesday. I went to work the next morning and got a text from him that he has to stay for at least two more days, approximately Friday. Wednesday evening, I got home from work and played a match of Rogue Company when someone suddenly rang the doorbell. That's unusual because we never have unannounced visitors. I walked to the door and was about to press the door buzzer to open the main door when I heard, I believe, more than one voice directly in front of my door. So that someone just got past the main door. Weird. I asked in German. Hello, who is it? Silence for three seconds. Then a person who sounds like my father, but at the same time doesn't sound like my father answers. Mika, it's me. I forgot my keys. Open the door. I thought, okay, in that case, wait a minute. My dad never called me Mika, only Mickey, and there was that sarcastic tone in the voice. I didn't trust the situation. I called my father on his phone. If the person in front of my door was my father, his phone should ring, right? Right, it didn't. Big whoop. My father answered, and as I suspected, he was still in the hospital. Meanwhile, the two people on the other side of the door heard my phone call and started kicking my door. Let me in, Mika. It's your daddy. Let me in. Thank God that door's reinforced. After I threatened them with calling the police and having a big ass knife in my hand, they left. I heard their footsteps running down the staircase. I rushed to the window facing the street to check if I can see a car or a license plate. Nothing. Just a few footsteps in the distance. They never came back. What's weird is they knew my name and that my father wasn't home despite his car standing in the driveway. Shit was hitting the fan when a buddy reported something similar. We called the police. Investigation in process. So, I was about 13 or 14 when this happened. I had been in a really dark place mentally, and I met this guy through Tumblr. He told me his name was John, and he thought I was really pretty, and ran a cool Tumblr. He used pictures of this super generic emo guy, and my teen heart was hooked. We talked for days and nights. And at one point, I told him the town I lived in. Because my parents worked late, I'd get home from school and usually be by myself at home. And I'd sit in the living room, which had this big window facing the street. If you looked in, you could see people and the TV and stuff. And I always kept the curtains open for light. So about two weeks after John and I were talking, I'd notice this white sedan drive slowly past my house at least once a day. Usually right after I got home from school. I also noticed that whenever I was watching something and texting John, he'd find a way to bring the show into conversation. I didn't think much of it at first, because usually it was shows I reblogged on my page before. That was until I started watching Pretty Little Liars on ABC Family. I hadn't posted or reblogged anything about the show, and then John started bringing it up, and I thought it was really weird. When I asked him about it, he said I just seemed like the type of girl who watched it, so I dropped the issue. Fast forward two weeks, and I'm with some friends at a nearby park. I wasn't having a good day, so we decided to hang out and do photo shoots or whatever. So we're walking around, and I turn my head and boom, there's a white sedan. Except it's closer, and I can see the person in it. It's this older guy, maybe in his 20s, just watching us. I got really uncomfortable, but I didn't bring it up, and then my friend suggested that we go to the playground, which is right next to the parking lot. But at this point, none of my friends knew about the issue, and I wanted to seem cool, so I went along with it. We dicked around on the playground for a bit, when I noticed the guy in a white sedan get out of his car and walk towards us. My middle school brain is trying to rationalise that this can't be the same sedan that kept sitting outside and driving past my house and maybe the guy was just watching his kid or something. I wish that were the case. I went over to the ward fountain to grab a drink and the guy comes up to me. 
guy. Hi there. Um, hi. Guy. You're... He said my tumbler handle, right? My blood went ice cold. Me. Um, yeah, who are you? He smiled at me, this really wide grin. I'm John. I came to see you in person. You told me the town you lived in and how you wish we could meet. Listen, I gotta get back to my friends, I said. No, 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 no. Why don't we take a drive? We can go to McDonald's, he said. He grabbed my arm at this point, and I think one of my friends had noticed because she came up to us, and the John guy released me and started to back up. My friend said, Hey Lizzie, Mum said we gotta head home. Dad's home, and he had a long day. I nodded and walked away with her. My whole group of friends crowded me as we headed back to my house. I never told my parents what happened that day, and none of my friends did either. None of us wanted our tumblers exposed, and we thought we'd get in trouble for what happened, even though I was the only one at risk. When we got home, I blocked John and reported the account, thanking my friends for saving me. It's scary what could have happened if they hadn't been there, and I don't think the story would have had a happy ending. Alright, so I did want to clear up a few things here about what I've seen commented. I ended up having a long talk with my mum about the situation, and while I didn't have any records of the Tumblr interactions, I did have the login to the Snapchat account I made to talk with him, and just realised that while typing out this story, I never mentioned the Snapchat bit, we'll get back to that later. She didn't think we'd actually get anywhere really with the police, but we went anyway. We filled out some paperwork, but the man we talked to said that because the account the stalker had used had blocked me, and I didn't have much other proof, as well as the other friends at the time not being able to report as witnesses, there wasn't much they could do. There is a record of the incident, however. I posted this mid-breakdown because I had a flashback to the event and had to get it out, and forgot to mention the Snapchat interactions. It was most of the same as the Tumblr interactions, except I didn't hide my location on Snapchat. It showed my town, street name, etc. That's why the stalker was able to come so close to me so quickly. All of my information was pretty much out there for the taking. Trust me, I'm on ghost mode and forever will be on ghost mode on Snapchat. I hope this has cleared a few things up. Thanks for convincing me to go to the police. I hope I helped someone somewhere. I really want to thank the author for giving me permission to narrate this story. This is one that I really feel could help a lot of people because your privacy settings are so important on your social media and you never really know who you're talking to out there, especially if you don't know them or if you don't know them that well. So this story really highlighted to me how it's so important to just go to your settings, put yourself on ghost mode on Snapchat, or just enable your privacy settings so only your close friends can see it. Also, it's good to let someone know where you are at all times, especially, I mean, for everyone, but especially for the female listeners that I have. I want to make that a good, like, I, I really want to get that point out of there because I've heard of so many of you telling me about how you've been followed by creepy guys or whatever. And I know, I know it happens both ways around, but I think for the most part, it happens to females. So I just want to put out there, you know, let someone know where you are, share your location with someone that you trust and that can look after you, if you know what I mean, like, not look after you, but you know, I'm, you know what I'm saying, like, just look out for you, that's what I'm trying to say, look out for you. So, I, I, I would recommend that, this is what I do with my girlfriend and my mum, so I've got this app, I think it's called Life360, and basically you can um, share your location with someone and have like a little circle, so you can see where they are, how fast they're going, how much charge they've got on their phone, so at least you know if anything happens, you don't get a reply, you know where they are. So I'd recommend that you guys get that. I think it's better than find my friends on iPhone. But this is something I really think is a good thing to download. Just let people know where you are, male and female. Especially if you're going out somewhere, if you're going to a rough part of town or whatever. Let people know where you are. So I want to say thank you to the person who let me narrate this story. I really appreciate it. It was from That's a Cool EAF. Oh, that's a cool leaf. <laughs> that wasn't the best um, the best way to say it, but yeah. Thank you very much for letting me narrate your story, and I really think it puts across a good message. So make sure you guys go and keep yourself safe and put your safety and security settings on. Anyway, on to the next story. Years ago, my family and my family's friends would go camping at some cabins in Lake Placid, New York. Despite what happened that weekend, that campground holds very fond memories for me that I will cherish forever. 
The incident happened 4th of July weekend. My family was grilling, and me and my friends, children at the time, were running around and playing cops and robbers. While we played, the campground owner came over to my parents and offered to pay for some food. My parents, being nice, gave him food and a beer for free. Eventually, the owner overstayed his welcome and was asked to leave by my friend's dad. This angered him, and he took off his shirt and tried to fight him. We were not aware that he was an alcoholic and already drunk when he asked for food and beer. They eventually got him to leave and he came back, this time with a rifle. As me and my friends played, he walked around drunkenly, tried to load a rifle. One of my friends, being an innocent kid, walked over to him and asked what he was doing. The owner said, I'm going to show your dad something. One of the adults saw this and rushed over. My friend's dad took the rifle from his hands and threw it across the parking lot, screaming at him that there were kids around. At this point, I knew something bad was happening, and I rushed all my friends inside our cabin. At this point, my dad called the police and was recording the whole thing. The police eventually came and arrested him for the night, while the campground owner tried to claim he never had a rifle while saying on video, Give me my rifle. The police came back the next morning and let us file a temporary restraining order while we stayed the weekend. While this is an incident my family laughs at from time to time, I can't help but wonder what would have happened if he had gotten that rifle loaded. So to the campground owner, let's not meet. So, my fiance and I have been on the lookout for a kitten to accompany our three month old kitten we have already. We searched and searched until one day he said to me, let's look on Craigslist. So I did. We found the perfect one, but the only problem was it was 2 hours and 30 minutes away from our home. I inquired about it at around 10.30pm. I know it was late, but I almost immediately got a response. She sounded very nice over text and asked to see where I live so that she would feel settled about the kitten living with us. She also insisted on going to their house. I know, I should have just dropped it. At the time, I thought nothing of it. So I sent them a video. We sent up a time for the next day to meet. The next day came. I wasn't going to take my fiance, but he insisted on coming with me because he wanted to be my protection because Craigslist is sketchy. So we drove 2 hours and 30 minutes on our way there. As we were on our way, I was texting this girl that we would get there on time and she responded, great, see you then. We arrived to the home, me in the driver's seat and my fiance in the passenger seat with the window down. I texted the girl and got no response. I called and got no response. I ended up calling five times and texting in the course of an hour and no response. I went up to the house and knocked on the door. Nothing. There was a car in the driveway, but no response from the number or the door. We got there at 6.30 and waited until almost 8. Nothing. The neighbour came out asking what was wrong. I said I'm here since I inquired about a kitten and she said, A kitten? I said, yeah, it was an ad on Craigslist. She said, no one has kittens in this home though. I showed her the ad and she said, oh, I know them. They're very sketchy people and they don't even own any cats. I just helped them move their furniture yesterday. So I said, well, on the ad it says they have to get rid of their kittens since a new place doesn't allow pets. So the neighbour said, that's impossible, I have a dog. And so does the neighbour the next door over. I immediately found this creepy and assumed the neighbour was also in on something since it was too creepy and I was feeling anxious. I thanked her and left along with my fiance. Literally immediately when we pulled out of the street, I got a text from the girl saying, I'm just now getting your messages, something must be wrong with my phone. Did you still want the kitten or no? I didn't answer and we headed back home. What I don't understand is, they didn't get any money from me, but they asked me to show up not knowing my fiance would be with me. I had a bad feeling about it. What did they want from me? When I was 12 years old, I got an unusual opportunity. I was able to be involved in a study abroad program where I would live in England for several months, from a very small town in the US originally. The program was run through my middle school, and I went over to England with a group of 15 other 12 year olds. Before we went to the homes we would be living in for the next few months, we ended up staying in London for about a week to do some sightseeing. 
When we got there, we were staying in a small hostel downtown, and my school had essentially rented out the entire hostel for the kids and for the adults that were chaperoning the trip. If I remember correctly, there were two adults with us. Every day, we'd have a scheduled activity, and then we'd have a significant amount of free time where we were allowed to explore the city as a group with just the kids and no adults. The second day, we were there, and my friends and I were out together, and we ended up stopping to look at some kiosks that had souvenirs. We were about a block from our hostel. I was around the back side of the kiosk. It would look like I was there alone, and I felt someone grab my arm. I turn around to see a middle-aged man, most likely homeless, looking at me, and he says, Hello there, pretty little girl, in the creepiest voice I've ever heard. I immediately darted out of the other side of the kiosk back to my friends. Before I could even tell them what happened, he came around the corner and got super close to me and said, You can run, you can hide, but I'll find you. And then he walked away. I immediately grabbed my friend and started pulling her back towards the direction of our hostel. I was crying, and when we got back there, we told our chaperones what happened. They essentially brushed it off and didn't do anything. Every day we were in London from then on, I would see him once or three times a day when we were out. He would never get close, would never say anything but he would always be smiling and watching me. Every time I would see him, I would point out to either one of the chaperones or another kid in our group. On the last day we were there, we were getting ready to leave and we're catching a train from London to Leeds. While we were waiting at the train platform, I hear, bye bye little girl, I'll see you soon. And I turn around and sure enough, he's there. He quickly leaves and again, no one in my group really does anything. Except for the other kids, they were all completely freaked out. I never saw him again after seeing him on the train platform, but I still remember his voice. Every time I think of it, I get a shiver down my spine and think about how close the danger I was. First off, this isn't my story, but rather my mother's. The first time I heard this, I was about 12 years old, and ever since then, I've never been able to forget. When my mum was a little girl, her family moved into a small house in Lansing, Michigan. My mother said that immediately she got this overwhelming feeling of uneasiness when she first walked through the threshold, and that's how she knew something wasn't right. Within a few weeks, she started having insanely intense night terrors about a man with a hat, which she called the Hat Man. She said that he started out just standing outside her window, staring in. But as time progressed, he made it into the corner of her room, and then to the end of her bed, and then finally standing right over her. She said, and I quote, It was terrifying because I couldn't see his face, no matter how hard I tried or how close he was. What made it worse is that he just had this malevolent, evil energy that made me sick whenever he was in the room. After about a week of complaining to her parents about the hat man, they took her to the doctors and she was prescribed sleeping pills and of course they didn't work and the night terrors continued by this time her birthday had rolled around and her parents gave her a baby doll but not just your average run-of-the-mill baby doll it was one that laughed and crawled when you put batteries in it and switched it on immediately my mum was scared of it because that very night my mum woke up and the doll was laughing and crawling across the floor as the hat man stood looming over it this happened for several nights before my mum's parents finally duct taped the switch so that it remained on the off position. But alas, the doll still laughed and crawled in the middle of the night. So instead of throwing it away, my mum's parents decided to take the batteries out and pray that it didn't happen again. The doll didn't move for a few nights and my mum thought that she was out of the woods. But she was wrong. One night, my grandma was woken up by laughter in the living room in the middle of the night. Of course, she just assumed it was one of her daughters, so she walked out of the living room, but what she saw stopped her dead in her tracks. Her hair stood on end as she witnessed this baby doll that didn't have batteries in it, crawling right after her. Meanwhile, my mum was lying in bed, unable to move, as the hat man stood over her and laughed maniacally. Finally, she was able to scream and her mother came rushing in. There wasn't much to the story after that, except for the fact that they moved houses not long after and my mother still sees the man to this day standing over her bed. However, recently I decided to google the hat man. Turns out many people from all over the globe have seen this very same entity. But what really gets me is they all describe its energy and the way it looks the same way. Evil.
got some D&D this morning and it brought this story back to mind, so I figured I'd share it here. During high school and college, I worked at Dunkin Donuts for about 7 years and bounced around to a few different locations. I was used to working at the D&D in my town, where we would get the yeast rings delivered periodically and frost them ourselves as needed. I transferred to a new shop about half an hour from my house with all the same responsibilities, except for the donuts. They were delivered by corporate, and they arrived frosted almost perfectly. They looked like the plastic donuts they show in the commercials. Always round and not squished together, and they would dip them in frosting so it was evenly spread and neat. It was a busy Saturday morning, and we were close to Valentine's Day, so we had a fresh order of brownie batter donuts delivered that morning. We were slammed, which was normal for a weekend, so it wasn't out of the ordinary to see my manager, who I'll call Jeremy, running around stressed out. When he ran past me, I didn't think anything of it, and I continued making sandwiches at the sandwich station. He rushed by carrying a pastry tray, and I watched him begin frantically throwing something in the trash, looking worried as hell. At first I laughed and said, Jeremy, what the heck are you doing? He straightened out and looked absolutely beside himself. I've never seen Jeremy look so lost, so I asked what was going on and if something was wrong. Someone filled the brownie batter donuts with staples. He told me he got a phone call from Corpora that one of our stores in our chain, which contained 10, had somehow discovered multiple staples in every donut in their order. That was at least 48 donuts for our store, and more or less for the other 9, depending on their sales. They told Jeremy that we had to get rid of the most recent delivery, because whoever put the batter in the filler dumped a ton of staples in it as well. Thankfully we hadn't sold all of the previous order yet from the morning, because it was still relatively early. But the more I thought about it, the more I felt like I was going to be sick. What if a young child had gotten in one of them? I pictured the family sitting at home on a Saturday morning, going to get some drinks and donuts for the kids, and imagined everything else that could have happened after. I never found out what came of it, and as far as I know, neither did my boss. I'm assuming nothing happened, because I thankfully never heard anything on the news. Makes me wonder if they covered it up, and I hope they were able to find out who did it.